Hi, I'm John Yeomans, uh, a farm with my wife Sarah and our three boys, Tom, Jack and Joe, at Luna Bryan Adva, just above Newtown. Um, my wife's probably much more crucial to the business than I am, but, and my three sons, uh, Tom, the eldest one's home at the moment, but uh, all of them travel and work all over the world. Jack has, in fact, just become a citizen in uh, Australia. But all of them, every decision we make of any size on the farm, we involve them in it wherever they are in the world. Originally I'm from Birmingham and my wife is from London and the way we came around here really my dad had, uh, was a butcher in Birmingham and his family had links to farming. I had no interest in farming at all and he, uh, uh, when he was 60, bought uh, Thluna Brine which was in 1973 when I was about 11. So the, the sort of background to the farm really, uh, obviously when it was 68 acres a lot less stock but uh, it's about 274 or something like that now spread over a few different blocks. Uh, we, we run around about sort of 70 to 80 suckler cows and, and about 10 or 15 replacement heifers. It's all closed herd, some pedigree limousines, Belgian blues and a few uh, Canadian speckled park which is sort of more of a native bred type beast. Um, and then predominantly Beulah ewes, we tap around uh, 700 including the ewe lambs. Um, and the, so the, the farm at home is sort of harvested for silage, a lot of that is shut out, most of it's shut out just graze a few cows at home during the summer and then most of the stock come up here to the two hill blocks that we've got. Uh, we got into this rotational grazing uh, 2013 really after, I'd obviously seen it's been going for obviously many decades um, and, uh, and I'd, we'd, we'd had 2013 which is a really tough year on a lot of farmers, a lot of snow during lambing and we were kind of thinking well we're going to have to change something or, or give up basically and try and become more efficient. So we started doing more then and, and we've sort of brought that across the whole farm really, um, which has increased the stocking rates massively really. So the way I'd sort of say it to people is by buying a bit of electric fencing. If you, if you had 100 acres um, and you bought some electric fencing, which obviously is a cost to it, there's a lot of experts would say you'd get at least 20% 20 20 extra grass growth and better utilisation. So for the cost of some electric fencing, you're basically farming 120 acres. So we started splitting this up then in about 2014. Uh, <clears throat> we had pretty reasonable fences here. So this top section that we're on now, we split that into eight. And, um, and then by rotating the stock around, the grass gets rested and, and grow, seems to grow better. So this is monitored a bit more expertly by, by Chris Duller uh, with the cages and stuff you can see around. So um, in 2020, we got up to, and it's quite a short growing season here because we're at 1,420 feet, it's pretty wet, uh, it's quite deep peat. We got up to about 10 tonne of dry matter per hectare, which we were quite chuffed about. Uh, and then last year we got to almost 13 tonne. But in the meantime, when you look at it and you think, oh, you know, it looks pretty monoculture sort of stuff. But we've got, you know, we've got plantain, we've got clovers, we've got timothy and things like that. But also the hair have come back a lot more. Uh, and we did have a lot of uh, lapwing came back up to about 65 lapwing were up here but sadly they've declined due to predation pro probably and possibly badgers but also uh, a lot of uh, big uh, gulls come up here and set about them but we've got a lot of curly about there's several nests in here and there's some back at home as well and, and as i've said before really i think it's really crucial that the farming and the environment thing go hand in hand and and should do and if you don't get the farming bit up some shape you can't afford to do the other bits so one of the problems up here was water that uh, when you do this rotational grazing you obviously got to get water and up here it can go you either be very very wet or very very dry so we've sunk uh, concrete rings in and put water troughs around the hill as uh, we've got sort of half a dozen or so water troughs around um, and then but we've also as you can see there's a pool down here uh, and we put a solar pump on there and we're pumping water up and then we've got water being gravity fed back around which has made the grazing a lot better uh, and we have cattle up here in the, in the, well, in the next, hopefully in the next few weeks and, and on the other block we've done as well. So we're sort of trying to do a kind of a rounded thing of, of trying to farm to make a living and, and pay our HSBC loans off, which are, uh, I think the final one is to, when I'm 79 years old, if I can get that far. But, um, but try and do, you know, good stuff for the environment, like, like most farmers are doing, I think. And I think most farmers, you know, it's, it's lovely to see the wildlife and stuff and the environment thriving, but also as we, you know, we intend to put sort of uh, trees down the side here a little bit to help the, help the um, shade and stuff like that. And then you get a, you know, a bit of a microclimate and in, within your hedges and your trees, which, which can lift the yields of the grass and obviously helps the wildlife and helps the shelter of the stock. So, 
you know, we're just like most farmers, we're just trying to do the right thing, really. So when the kids were little, we used to come, and when my mum and uh, dad were alive, come down and occasionally have a, have a picnic down here. But it's not, and it's, it goes up and down pretty rapidly when there's a flood and stuff. But yeah, it's nice, and it's nice to see. I haven't been down here for a little while. Tom's down here most night with it, taking the dogs for a walk, but it's nice to see all the trout back and stuff, you know, because there was a bit of a spell, I suppose, where farmers didn't have such a good name. But uh, from what you were saying and, and the things you've found, you know, there's no pollution in this river, which is really good news. You know, and it's, it's nice to have these things. You know, we're, we're lucky to live here and uh, lucky to be able to sort of share it, really. The, the sort of trend was, oh, it's great if you've got natural water on the farm, which, which it kind of is. But the downside, if you're downstream from anybody, potentially, that's not running down neighbours or anything like that, but potentially you could have, you know, their disease or our disease could be spreading further down river. So we, we're tending to gradually work around the farm, sort of fencing out the watercourses, which also leaves a bit of a wildlife corridor and stuff like that. And you haven't got to worry about sheep getting stuck in the river and yeah. things like that. So we've, we've tended to put water troughs out in the fields, which, yeah. which helps with the rotational grazing we do as well, you know. You're looking over across here now at ancient wooden plants, the wooden enemies. Can you tell us a bit more about the, the woodland and the plants we're finding in there? We've been told before that a lot of species here that indicate as ancient woodland, but I was reading an article from Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust just last week that said that wooden enemies are a big indicator because they spread so slowly. And uh, we've got one or two here. We're seeing some more wildflowers come back as well. Uh, early purple orchids, we had two, but now we're seeing a lot more, more every year. We've got some just behind us and uh, one area that used to be fenced off, it was just being openly grazed as the fences have fallen down over time. So I hot wired it off last year just to give the saplings a chance to grow back. I realised no new trees were coming back and about a hundred uh, early common orchids, I think they are, came back. A new species we've never seen here before. Uh, we used to be lucky if you saw one heron. Now we're seeing seven at a time quite frequently. I was camping down here last summer with my girlfriend and we were woken up by a heron in the middle of the night. Wow. We've got uh, the thrush has come back now. We haven't seen a thrush around here for a few years. See them almost daily at the moment. Uh, field fairs and red wings, haven't seen them before. They came through with the starlings this, uh, this winter and early spring. Yeah. There's some flower in there if you want to see one with a flower in it. But there was, oh, there's like oxide daisies. There's all sort of rucks of stuff there was. I was a little chuffed with how it come because it just looked horrendous, didn't it, Tom, for, for months, literally months probably. And then come about September-ish, wasn't it, Tom? It come up and just was all flowering. There's one bit flowering there. Yeah. Well, we only planted it last year, see? So we waited it for, for it to come up because I, I, the, one of the beekeepers here had said, oh, you can buy a wildflower bale of hay off somebody that they knew. And, and I was going to roll it round and then the woman, I spoke to her on the phone, she never got back to us. So we've done all of this without Grant and this fence up here. So we want to double fence that at some point. We put it in about May time last year and then waited and waited and all that seemed to be coming was sort of thistles and docks and what have you. But it was amazing by sort of September, October time, you know, there's a few just starting to flower now, but it was just a, a real sea of flowers. It was really lovely, but no grant on it at all or anything like that. It's just because we thought it was a nice thing to do, really. We put in a couple of ponds there, again, no grant on them, but we just, it was a wet old area. We did that a long time ago, 20, 30 years ago, but there's loads of, yeah, loads of damselflies and, and, um, and dragonflies and stuff like that on it, you know, and a lot of insects and stuff. So, um, yeah, I'm hoping, you know, we're hoping it'll come. It's just trying to control these weeds amongst it without it to, without affecting the flower sort of thing. So we, we were trying to do that almost individually, really. So the benefits of, of areas like this on the farm for, for wildlife, mm. so you've got your pollinators, bird life as well, looking at you know, the seed production as well from this, and just a haven, you know, like a, like a rough yeah. area for, for birds to nest, yeah. animals, insects. And it's, and it's just nice to see, isn't it? I know you could argue that we're kind of sacrificing productive you know, land, but it's not a huge patch. And um, I don't know if you, if your life was all about money, you probably wouldn't be farming. I'd say, really. <laughs> We 
were been renting this ground since about uh, the year 2001, I think it was, and then we were very fortunate that the, the landlord gave us a chance of buying it in 2018 or 19, I think. So there's quite a tall hedge here, and this area below was a sort of a bog, and the stock could sort of roam back all over the place. And then last year, Tom put up an electric wire across it, and then loads of uh, various wildflowers, a lot of orchids and stuff, like hundreds came, and we sort of fancied trying to get the hedge back under control and stuff like that. And that and, uh, and as I was saying before, you know, you get getting the fencing right helps the wildlife over here and helps our grazing over here. So we can hopefully be more efficient and, and lift the production of the farm. Um, and uh, you know, and it's it's lovely to see really. It was fenced by a, a lad who's not really a lad anymore. He's quite an elderly bloke of about 50 called uh, Carwin Jones. Who's uh, you know, who's won a lot of. Uh, hedging competitions. It was quite a difficult one to do, as you can see, there's some big old stuff in it, but it's lovely to see it's, it's not that long ago that he finished his in the last couple of months, but it's already budding up, you know, so, uh, and there's a lot of firewood to be had out of it as well, so, you know, really pleased with it. And we were talking before about GDFCT um, looking at the, the hedgerow code now that we would be able to quantify the amount of carbon mm. sequenced in, within these, these hedgerows, so hopefully we can come back and maybe measure this, it'd be great. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, maybe it's not recognised enough that, that, that there's, tragically, there's some whole farms being bought up for tree planting, but just, you know, ordinary farming that we're all doing is all, you know, doing a lot of good carbon stuff, really, and a lot of us, you know, we've stopped ploughing many, many years ago, and, do, you know, we do a lot of reseeding, but it tends, tends to be surface treatment stuff, and, uh, you know, it's, it's good for carbon, it's good for the production of the farm, because it's lifting the production of the farm and hopefully lowering our bills a bit, although everything's going through the roof. But, uh, but you know, it's, it's sort of good all round, really, and, I, and I, it disappoints me that some of the policy makers haven't recognised some of the good work that's been going on on farms for generations, really. This piece, although it's only about three and a half acres, uh, and I should have already done it before we put the stock on, but we're busy lambing. This will be fenced into four quarters, and then the plan will be they'll, you know, they'll bear each piece off two or three days, or a little bit more, hopefully a bit more, and then gradually move them around, and it will be growing up behind them. And there's, you know, plantain, chicory, several different sorts of clover, red clovers, timothy, stuff like that in it. And, and the belief being that um, there's a sort of medicinal quality through through the uh, plantain, and there's varying depths of root. So it's good for the soil structure, but also can cope with more extremes of the weather is the plan. But we've, we've used, uh, we put chicory in many years ago on the hill and it was too wet for it. And we've used plantain on the hill, which I like, but we can't get the longevity on it. Um, so a good friend of mine, Ewan Owen, who used to teach me in college said, well, put a whole field in and see how that goes. But it might only last two or three years, but we'll see. I know we were speaking to another farmer in the farm network and they, they just going into the world of, of herbal lays now. Um, on a dairy farm and what what they were astounded by and what the farm manager was talking about the amount of insect life that was mm. increased on the on the herbal lays going from a, a rye gas field to a herbal lay have you noticed that at all well i think when we've put the chicory uh, the plantain i mean on the hill um you they, in welsh as you would know they call it pencaled and they hardhead and well, there's a little beetle or something crawling across there now there just go. um and um we so you kind of it's at a, as it gets on into the summer those will actually come up into head so I suppose they're going to draw more insects and things like that really. And your, and your mixtures of clovers as well. Yeah. Um, pollinators. Yeah. And by the sort of shutting them off and moving them so that you know it's it's hopefully allowing it to thrive more and hopefully the you want the crowns of these plants to I think red clover particularly and the plantain and the chicory they get they won't stick it if you give the crown of the plant a hiding and the, and the beekeepers that we've got they've got a few hives here we're saying that they they love the plantain and all that sort of stuff so hopefully hopefully it all it's a gainer all round we'll see I, I, I'm not sure how long it's going to last so before we put too much more in <coughs> we'll see how that goes you know but the bet even if it's relatively short term it might be that the benefits we have from it uh, because we don't plough or anything, we just do mostly surface treatment, kind of uh, that it's not terribly expensive to establish, so we'll see how we go. Obviously the belief is that there is a medicinal quality and these trace elements are coming up and stuff like that. Well, have you analysed the parasite, have you taken FEC pack? Or yeah, well, we do, do FEC analyses about every two weeks once they get going. Uh, we do a lot with Zoetis, so they were involved in this parasite watch thing with them. So we use that as a kind of an indicator and we, we also try to, but uh, things like nematodires, I mean, you've got to do the whole lot, but we try to do uh, a bit of um, uh, worming on weight gain. Yeah. <coughs> so if, the, if their sort of grams per day is less than a threshold, we haven't picked a particularly high threshold, only about 200 grams a day. Um, you know, but that's a you know kilo every five days, and it sort of thing. Um, then we drench them if they're below and not above. So on, on, I think the best lot we were doing last year 
We'd done them with StarTech, which is one of these, you know, kill all known worms dead sort of thing. Uh, and the one lot that we'd done with them, I think when we came around maybe six weeks later, I think we only had to worm about 13% of them. And they had pretty good growth rates compared to the ones we hadn't done, so. You know, if you're in the, if you're in the red, you can't be green. So if, if you can't farm productively and the government needs to wake up to this, then you can't do, you know, these other things. You can't do that extra fencing and stuff like that. And I think it's really crucial. And I, and I also, you know, it really annoys me that some, uh, you know, there's some sort of advisors and, and people that, that uh, policy makers and one or two others think that, you know, it's either environment or productive farming. And I think the two are in, inextricably linked, really. Yeah, that's uh, that's and one of our beliefs as yeah. well, GWGT. Yeah. In Wales, that, you know, they can be hand in hand. And, and it's essential that they're hand in hand. It is, and I think we've, we've used, I mean, we've had grants on, on some of the stuff we've done, but we've done a lot of stuff without grant. But, uh, you know, getting those field boundaries better and getting a good hedge, you get the shelter, you get the wildlife corridor, but it means that you can graze the ground in between more efficiently, I think, really. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it, it works well together. You know, we've had no grant on this fence or anything, but it, it, it should just make it all easier to, to manage, really. And, uh, you know, a, a favourite saying of mine, uh, I'm not very good at doing the first bit, but is um, live as if you'll die tomorrow and farm as if you'll live forever. You know, and it's, I don't suppose I'll see these trees up much, you know, before I keel over, but, it, you know, it's a long-term thing, isn't it? You're doing it for the next, you know, many generations to come, really.